Hello everybody. So, a word for the wise, if you have to wear sunglasses, your period furniture is probably incorrectly stored, but for the ends of this particular video today, five to 10 minutes, uh, we are going to do it in the sun because the pieces look cooler in the sun, don't they? <laughs> and of course, you know, welcome to the channel or back to the channel if you're new here, which is first and foremost a way for me to share with you the most compelling period pieces that I find. Now, I hope this is going to appeal to seasoned collectors and to art historians, but I think for everybody, this will be an occasion to experience generally pretty remarkable items, such as this 200-year-old desk from the Charles X period from Paris here. But the overarching goal of this channel is to really preserve some knowledge of furniture history and to help you understand, really, what types of traditional furniture from the past are most valuable and why namely through the discussion of pre-industrial period pieces such as this, which really differ in every way from what we generally qualify as an antique. And so today's video should be a fairly thorough one because this piece has been published several times and it's a very relevant example of this short-lived style. So here we have a very fine Parisian secretary desk, which is a perfect example of the Charles X style from right about the year 1825 with this model. Now, Charles X furniture is remembered as being some of the most refined in history, and the duration of this furniture style corresponds loosely to the duration of the reign of King Charles X from 1823 to 1830. But the style emerges a little bit earlier than that, and it occurs throughout the 1820s, and it lasts up until, say, the mid-1830s. The Charles X style itself would fall under the umbrella of Restoration Period furniture, referring to the decorative movements and the arts of the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy in post-Napoleonic France. And now, as we pan over this piece, we're going to see why Charles X furniture is remembered as being the height of the art of inlay in furniture history, with this remarkable precision in the quality of execution. There's a hyper-refinement to these neoclassical motifs, this scrolling foliage, and this is really a decor that's inspired by ancient Greco-Roman art, which is why this Charles X style would be referred to as a neoclassical one. Even though it's old now, at the time it was a new expression of ancient classical art. And so this Charles X style is one of the final chapters in the evolution of European neoclassicism, which is an artistic or a decorative movement that begins about 70 years before this was made in the 1750s after the excavations of Pompeii. So what's interesting about being in the 1820s here with a style like this, near the end of that pre-industrial timeline in furniture history, is that furniture making traditions had become so evolved by this point in time, tools and techniques had become so advanced, that although we are late in the traditional timeline of what's good to collect, well, furniture from this time presents a really overwhelming quality of execution which is very apparent in an example like this, which really represents the finest domestic quality secretary that would have been made at the time. Anything more refined than a piece like this would really tend towards official state furniture, which is different than even the finest domestic pieces. So this piece is particularly relevant because it's really at the apex of what's possible artistically in furniture before furniture becomes something that's not really furniture at all anymore. It's rather a stage prop for, for governments. So starting from the top, we see the blue-gray marble, which is typical of the finer, finest pieces of the day. And this one has been adorned with two lines, which forms a marble, a marbre à trois gorges in French, a marble with three gorges. And these lines are going to be absent from less luxurious models of the day. But something that's particularly interesting that I've never seen before is the natural white spot that was planned to align with the keyholes of the piece. That's a pretty harmonious addition to this piece, which is really a thorough work of art, and such a little bit of planning seems even less surprising, though, when we consider this piece in the context of how it's an emblematic piece of Charles X furniture that's really fine enough to be used as a general benchmark for anyone interested or drawn to this rare style. But then moving right along, we're going to see a molding in lemon wood beneath this marble that kind of adds a fourth gorge to the marbre à trois gorges. And then below this, we see a strip of inlaid lemon wood. And then, of course, the wonderful symmetry of these inlaid palmettes that deploy from either side of that keyhole, before then moving down again to two raised fillets of lemon wood, before then eventually 
toppling on down through a series of moldings which then frame the uh, central facade of the piece. But then finally we move on down to the central facade here, which is the exterior of the fall front writing surface. Now of course we're going to move inside, that's the most interesting part of the desk, but let's first glance at the intelligence of some of these motifs here. These palmettes, these shell-shaped palmettes in the corner, which seem to also deploy a backwards bellflower motif, which itself aims a dart at the corner of these inlays. And now the central emblem here is actually a gadrooned vase full of ivy, which itself is a symbol of fidelity, this ancient plant that of course never lets go of anything. And so this ivy, this symbol of never letting go, of course ties into this neoclassical romantic style that's evoking a beautiful bygone past that of course never happened. But it actually really relates to this piece in the context of the 1820s, socio-politically in France, because this is sort of a desperately elegant example of one of the final artistic moments of the Bourbon monarchy here in the 1820s, which was trying to hold on to its own bygone glory days, to the elegance of the old regime. But anyway, on top of that, we're going to see that underneath this gadrooned vase full of ivy, that it is supported by an M shape and foliage, which itself seems to deploy bellflowers, scrolling acanthus, more ivy, and then perhaps two torches, if not two cornucopia. And so all of this is actually framed, and the lines of the inlaid frame curve together at their corners, which are marked again by an inlaid dot. And I thought we should just go over that before opening up the fall front to see that we have quite a lot more going on here than some inlaid squiggles. We have really a sophisticated work of design and execution here in these, you know, very attractive motifs that we're going to appreciate all over this piece that we might not necessarily slow down to really look at. So with that taken care of, let's take a look behind the fall front, which is accessed via the disengagement of a hefty locking mechanism, which I had already unlocked. And this particular fall front leather topped riding surface, it's going to descend with the help of a counterbalance, which helps it descend gracefully. And so this reveals the inner theater of the desk, uh, which is really just a gallery of English drawers and a shelf, but it's referred to as the theater simply because opening one of these is pretty much always dramatic. And this one presents a very special inlaid decor which simulates a gated private courtyard. Now, of course, this is true to the privacy of the letters that one would have written inside of this piece, but this is also a really wonderfully artful example, perhaps one of the most memorable examples of Charles X inlay work that we could expect to find. We're also going to see inside here these consoles and these pillars, which seem to sort of evoke an architecture that is necessary to hold up this top drawer, which itself seems to feature a repetition of the motif featured on the outside of the piece. And you're also going to notice how the inside of the piece is done in a wood color scheme that is the inverse of the dark background light inlay wood scheme of the exterior. And while we're in here, we're also going to notice that some of the inlay inside of this simulated gated courtyard, some of it has flecked off. Uh, but really even mentioning this is a bit of an exercise in allowing, oh, a couple of ugly trees to distract us from an entire beautiful forest here. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of flecked off inlay because we're really dealing with a 200-year-old artifact here. And we need to remember that as collectors, the same lens that we use to approach new items today that we might purchase you know, this is not at all the way we're going to approach a 200-year-old museum artifact, which might show some natural but ancillary signs of its age. We, as human beings, have a primitive survival mechanism which causes us to fixate on small little errors in our environment. And that's wonderful. It helps us contend with problems in the wild at the state of nature. But as collectors, you know, that primitive survival mechanism is what might allow us to look at a beautiful work like this and to immediately fixate on a small piece of missing veneer, which really has nothing to do with all that there is to appreciate here on a piece like this. And so let's finish up inside here just by mentioning that on a piece exhibiting this level of refinement, we're going to see that there's a real depth to that refinement. And so let's take a look at the joinery on these English drawers, which you're going to see is, is absolutely unnecessarily precise uh, with, with dovetail work that is itself actually very, very beautiful, uh, just like the rest of the piece. And now the central drawer here actually has a key uh, and a lock 
which is something that you're going to see on the nicest models of the day. But I want to point out that on this one, sometimes the lock is going to stay open after you lock it. Uh, meaning that the bolt will stay in a fixed position. And that's part of what happens on a 200-year-old lock. And so one needs to be careful when you identify that, never to lock this drawer because otherwise you'll be cutting it out. And now the fall front itself has retained its original brown leather. And you know, that's not completely out of the question. A lot of times we see the original leathers on these pieces. But nevertheless, to see this original gold embossed border here and this sort of rich brown caramel colored leather that goes so well with the maple interior, it's just nice to see that this has not been changed since the desk was made. And now when we close this fall front, we have to be very careful because the counterbalance that helps it descend gracefully would also allow this to slam in the other direction. So you always want to make sure that you hold the key and allow it to close carefully because otherwise, you know, can you imagine that happening uh, from a little bit farther down? It would make quite a noise. And I, I, I assure you that when a client inside of this space where we are right now, I, I do in fact receive clients, when a client slams one of these 200-year-old counterbalance secretaries accidentally, they incur my wrath in a way that they did not expect. Some of them don't come back after that. Well, so now let's take a look at the bottom compartment, which of course is for storage. And secretaries like this are referred to as secretaire en armoire for how the bottom compartment's open by two doors uh, like an armoire. <laughs> And so firstly, this is going to showcase on the exterior one of the most graceful, symmetrical, and elegant examples of Charles X inlay work that I have ever seen. And I think we should stop to take a look at that, especially at the intelligence of how this scrolling foliage motif of acanthus and bellflowers sort of scrolls around and frames a rosace, which itself contains the keyholes here. And so this one opens via another hefty locking mechanism, which itself has remained very reactive over the years. It just snaps, seemingly indicating that it wasn't used very often. But we're going to see that this locking mechanism is itself in line with the quality of the piece, as it's much heftier than they typically are. It ejects two bolts upwards at the top, and then a single bolt out the bottom, which at the second turn of the key actually descends far enough to lock this bottom drawer, which itself is dissimulated into the bottom of the piece. Now unfortunately here, the bottom drawer has bowed out such that the locking mechanism can no longer align with the little metal element here that it should align with and which would allow the bottom drawer to be lockable. But again, this buckled piece of wood, this little error that this 200-year-old artifact is now presenting relative to how it was 200 years ago, this is sort of like the inlay inside the desk that I'm certainly not thrilled that this drawer has buckled a little bit and that the lock no longer works. But again, we have to apprehend this with a different lens than what we use to evaluate new items that we'd purchase for our house today. I'm pretty sure that this piece of wood has buckled a lot less over 200 years than I would. So, <laughs> with that being said, let's open these doors and just take a look at these three English drawers, which are perfectly sized to slide back and forth. I haven't even waxed them. I doubt they've been waxed in 60 years. But they're just so seamlessly built here to slide in and out of this piece without any trouble at all. And if we remove them, we're actually going to be able to see up inside of the piece and we'll notice the counterbalance weight that's rigged to the fall front that we've already discussed. And so the next thing that we're going to do, just for giggles and also for the furniture enthusiasts among us, let's pan over the back of this piece for a moment because this also brings up this idea that a period piece like this is in a lot of ways like a painting. You know, if we look at the front of the piece, there's a real beauty here. This is a work of art. And if we look at the back of the canvas, we see that just like with a painting, there's nothing there. But what makes period furniture such a successful and unique art is in how this brings art seamlessly into our practical home environment. You know, a work of art like this is only in part an illusion because it's meticulously expressed in a three-dimensional form that actually reaches out from the wall, out from what would otherwise be pure illusion, and into our practical daily lives. Well, everybody, I really do hope that you've enjoyed taking a closer look at this piece. And just as a final 
point, I guess I'll mention, that a secretary like this is referred to as a salon secretary. Because it's imbued with a certain artistry, it has a decorative quality here that makes it appropriate for a main room of the house for a salon, even though generally by the 1820s here, secretaries were more associated with the office. And as a final academic reference, a secretary like this is on par in quality with the types of furniture that you're going to see in the Charles X room of the Paris Museum of Decorative Art, which is kind of the northwest wing of the Louvre, as well as an obscure but really remarkable collection of Charles X furniture, which is actually at the home of former French statesman. He's now very much deceased, but he was a writer and statesman, Chateaubriand who was kind of at the head of the French literary scene in the first half of the 19th century. But outside of Paris, at his house, which is now a museum, there's an absolutely wonderful collection of very fine domestic Charles X furniture like this. And so finally, if you have enjoyed this video and you'd like to support the endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of the pieces that I encounter, such as this, please like the videos and subscribe to the channel. That would be most appreciated. And again, I hope that you've enjoyed taking a closer look. Thank you.